Welcome back to Celebrity Bible Quiz. Before we begin our next round, I'd like to remind our contestants the only footprints in the sand are yours. Your mother and I made prints in the sand last night. That's... They weren't footprints. <sighs> Wonderful. One of them was an imprint of your mother's... Okay, now, that's extremely <laughs> unnecessary. Moving on, let's take a look at the scores. In last place with negative 12,000 points is Lee Strobel. I used to be an atheist. Good for you. I was an empty shell of a man who had no morals and no meaning and pretended to believe in evolution so I wouldn't have to be accountable to a higher power. In fact, I actually started writing a book uh, to prove that atheism is true, but the facts I uncovered made it impossible for me to continue denying Christ's resurrection. I'm certain almost none of that is true, and everybody just wants you to shut your giant face. And in first place with negative 3,000 points is... <sighs> Ray Comfort. Eh, uh, come on, you old buffoon. You know you love me. No, actually, I loathe you. And your loathing makes you watch me. Which makes me rich. So, basically, you're a professional troll. When the cameras are off, the answer is yes. Why do my producers keep booking you? I sent them a fruit basket. <laughs> that is vaguely but profoundly depressing. And finally, falling somewhere in between, is Jordan Peterson, whose answers so far have been so unrelated to any of these questions that his score is now those weird characters from the television show Lost. Uh, you know, when, when you think of the show as a, as a metaphor for the interactions that occur within cultures, at least those cultures that successfully uh, sustain basic hierarchical conventions and the face of temptation to succumb to individualistic determinism, the routine which Jack and Locke had to repeatedly enter a code uh, on a rigid 108-minute schedule, along with the dire consequences of, of breaking with this ritual, it taps into a profound recognition that the freedom the freedom that we feel in throwing off and ingrained social archetypes is actually illusory. And that our deepest core, uh, we all have a need for a uh, ritual and, and strict social... No, it does not. And please, for the love of God, at least wait to do that until you've been asked a question. Now let's take a look at the final board, and the categories are... Water to Wine, Prophecy, Amos, The Resurrection of Jesus. Lee, I think you'll take a perversely misguided delight in this category. Animals, this is about animals mentioned in the Bible, Genesis, and Biblical Scientific Foreknowledge. Mr. Comfort, you're in the lead, so tragically, you have the board. I'll take Amos for 400. That's Amos. Look, <laughs> Mr. Comfort, not only is that immature, but it's lazy. Seriously, how could anybody mistake that for anus? It's what your mother asked me last night. All right, you've lost the privilege of going first. Mr. Peterson, you're in whatever place these symbols rank you at, so you have control of the board. Well, you have to understand that Genesis is a profoundly meaningful book, which represents the metaphysical substrate of our... I think what you meant to say is Genesis for 600. And the question is, according to Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, who fathered the Nephilim? Mr. Strobel. The answer is angels. I'll take... No, that is incorrect. Mr. Peterson. So I think the best approach to this question is from the perspective of reconventionalized destructivism. And so really the giants uh, known as the Nephilim are... Of I'm going to stop you right there because not only are you wrong in wasting our time, but I'm pretty sure you just made up the words reconventionalized destructivism. And even if you didn't, you might as well have because your audience will never know the difference and will just sit there feeling vaguely impressed by you either way. Mr. Comfort, you're our last remaining contestant, so would you like to take a shot at this question? Mr. Comfort? Okay, fine, we'll move on to... Wow, now you want to answer. Whatever. Go ahead. The answer is angels. No, the answer is not angels, and Mr. Strobel already gave that answer and got it wrong. Oh yes, the answer is definitely angels. No, it is not. The answer is the sons of God. According to Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, God had multiple sons and they came to earth and bred with women to produce a race of demigod heroes known as the Nephilim. You know, I'm not going to debate this with you. God has revealed his truth to each of us, and deep down... 
You know he exists and is the one and only God. All I can do is urge you to stop suppressing knowledge of him in your heart and continue to indulge in the desires of the flesh. If you want to mock God in your reading of Genesis 6, then no argument I can present you will... And moving on, I don't know, let's let Mr. Lee Strobel take a shot at choosing a category. Oh, I'll take the resurrection of Jesus for 800. Very good. And the question is, according to Mark 16, what happened when the women went to visit Jesus' tomb? Mr. Strobel. What we have in this incredible eyewitness account, written down mere decades after the life of Christ, is a set of historical data that simply can't be explained by anything other than the bodily resurrection of Jesus. It's nice that you think so, but can you please answer the question? Well, what we see recorded in Mark 16 is exactly what happened in all other consistent and independently corroborating accounts from the other Gospels, told from the unique perspective of one of the eyewitnesses. And that is that three women, one of whom wasn't always mentioned, showed up at the tomb when an angel appeared and rolled the stone away. His appearance was so frightening that the guards, who aren't mentioned in all accounts, but that doesn't matter, even though they were definitely there, were so scared they passed out. But the angel told the women not to fear and commanded them to go tell the disciples. Then that same woman traveled to the tomb and found it already opened, so they immediately went to get the disciples without going inside. Then Peter and John came back to inspect the tomb and discovered Jesus was gone. Meanwhile, Mary stood outside and looked into the door to see two angels inside the tomb. And they asked her why she was crying, and then Jesus was standing next to her, uh, and also asked why she was crying. She then recognized him and was happy. Then the women went into the tomb to immediately discover a single young man, who was clearly an angel, already waiting inside. They were frightened by him, but he told them not to be, and told them that Jesus' body was gone because he had risen. Then the women looked around the tomb and wondered where Jesus' body was when the two glowing men, who were clearly angels, appeared next to them and they bowed in fear, and he told them roughly the same thing. That is spectacularly incorrect. Mr. Comfort. If you look at the complexity of a common Coke can... No. Mr. Peterson. What I think an account like this really tells us about ourselves is that we're all on a search for meaning and permanence. And, and the metaphysical imagery of Jesus, into whom his disciples had imbued their hope, dying and then rising from the dead in the face of abject despair, uh, even, even as their own hope itself was dying. Mr. Peterson, that is not answering the question and kind of treats the passage as a metaphor. Do you even think Jesus rose from the dead at all? You know, to uh, address the truth of Jesus' resurrection, which we really need to consider what it means uh, for an event depicted in this passage, it's, as in any work to be true, you know, many works of literature, including the writings of Dostoevsky, which I'd like to remind the audience that I'm familiar with, it, it portrays events happening. And how, how do I best say this? It, all the events contain many universal and I would say very profound truths. So so to approach these truths in, term, in terms of like, of did the, the depicted event, did this depicted event happen in the past is really reductionist, even childish. It robs both the work and even the core idea of truth of its power. So really, we need to ask ourselves, what utility can we find in these stories? And yes, but do you believe Jesus literally rose from the dead? And more directly to the point, if I may steer this back to the actual question, how does Mark 16 depict this event? So what I'm trying to tell you is that this is a very difficult question. And you can't just press me to reduce it to- Yes, it may very well be a difficult question, but the fact of the matter is you rang the buzzer, and so by choosing to speak on this topic indicated that you did indeed have an answer. Yes, but meaningful answers. Answers that really delve into the core subtext of the issue and probe what it means to be us are, are going to be complicated. Yes, I know some things are complicated, but some questions are simple and factual and have very straightforward answers. So when you step out and get our attention as if you actually have an answer, saying it's complicated doesn't give you an excuse to take a long meandering journey through a series of insinuations, dog whistles, buzzwords, and vaguely smart sounding vocabulary you know your audience doesn't really understand. All while purposely spinning your tires so you can vaguely identify with the things your audience believes when trying not to look stupid by committing to a belief in them yourself. So instead of doing that yet one more time, how about you instead finally, for once in your miserable life, just climb off the fence and answer the fucking question?
Look, let's just move on to our final question, which is, according to the Bible, what is the shape of the earth? Let's start with Ray Comfort, who wrote, Who designed the earth if there is no designer? Every painting has a painter, every building has a builder, and I'm just going to leave it there. And you wagered? That one day you'll discover I was right, and by then it will be too late. Wonderful. The Lord doesn't wish that you would perish. If only you would- I'm sure he doesn't. And next up is Jordan Peterson, who... And I'm not even going to read that, because once again he has declined to participate, and as always, just sat in the corner jerking off to his own words. Finally, we have Lee Strobel, who wrote, Round. Unfortunately, that is incorrect. The Bible depicts the Earth as being a flat disk under a dome surrounded by primordial waters, and you wagered 500. Well, sorry. Why didn't you read the rest of my wager? Fine. 500 eyewitnesses attest to the fact that I won this game by 11 billion points. Nice try, Mr. Strobel, but that is not true. You have fewer than zero points. But we have first-hand attestation going back within minutes of the claimed event that- Who cares? How could this tradition have developed so quickly after the time of the game if I had not actually won by 11 billion points? And if I were lying about something so fantastic, how could I have possibly gotten away with citing eyewitnesses who are still alive now? This is absolute historical gold. It most certainly is not. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this episode. Good night. This program was made possible by a grant from S.R. Foxley, Bob Generic, Brandon Lemire, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.